It sounds like situational might be where um, two people become triggered and it escalates. Yes. And yes. whereas your father's situation, uh, he was married to someone who just was throwing stuff at him no matter what. Yes. His was abusive and became more and more abusive over time. Just like a situational only, the only way, you know, I think it's very highly possible my husband and I could have gone for counseling, although we tried to after, and he didn't like being put in his place. Um, but I think that if we'd have tried early on, it was very highly possible that we could have worked our situation out. My dad was never... Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today we're going to be talking about, you know, we talk in this show a lot about conflict and different levels of conflict, but I don't think we've ever really defined what is high conflict. And the reason why this is important is everybody's experience of conflict is contextual, right? Like I love to say to people, I grew up in Armageddon uh, and so I'm really well suited for conflict, but my idea of Armageddon might not be the same as somebody else's. And so Today, we're going to interview Tina Huggins, certified divorce coach and expert in high conflict divorce on what does high conflict really mean. And I'm going to tell, tell you right off the bat, Tina has worked with some really fierce situations like that made me feel like maybe I don't know what Armageddon is kind of thing. How are you doing, Tina? Great. Thank you, Rich. It's a pleasure to have you on the show and speak with you again. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, the question I love to ask everyone in the beginning of the show is, Tina Huggins, how did your heart lead you to work with, in all, of all things, a high-conflict divorce? Well, we're going to step back in time. And so years back, I um, worked with law enforcement, and I helped to get women and children out of abusive homes and into a safe place or um, battered women's shelter, or sometimes what we called underground. Um, and I was a martial arts instructor at the time. And so mm -hmm. I would actually teach self-defense in these women's shelters or this specific women's shelter. And then fast forward just a little bit. Um, my dad was almost murdered by his second wife. Um, she shot at him several times. And then the last time, which when I stepped in, she drove over him with a dually pickup truck. Wow. Um, kind of messed up his neck a little bit, and his story didn't match. And so once I figured everything out, I helped to get him out of that relationship and to preserve what he and his dad had built um, because they were farmer ranchers and had built that all together. And during this time now, I was actually working as a coach and helping people with, with situational things. And one of the main things that would come to me a lot was people going through divorce. Mm -hmm. Fast forward just a little bit more. I ended up working for an attorney doing paper investigation on one client. And I came into the picture when he was about four years into his divorce. And during the time I worked on this, which was about another four years, I I realized that this was, I mean, I got to see his wife, how his wife slowed things down and how abusive she was, mm -hmm. how much damage she did to property. And, and I could see how much damage the legal team was doing because there were people hired to do things that weren't even certified. And he paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to this legal team and still never got anywhere. So at some point there, I realized I needed to get more tools. I needed to help men mm -hmm. like him go through this type of stuff. So I went and got certified as a divorce coach. And later, um, that specific person became my client. We got rid of that divorce team and within a year had everything complete. And he didn't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that done. His process took him over eight and a half years. And so... That's where I came into the picture as a divorce coach. I love it. Um, first of all, I, I love the way you laid out how 
even though working with a divorce coach might seem like an added expense, it can actually save you a tremendous amount, you know, because it helps you to be more strategic and more proactive and less reactive. But also, I uh, I, I just want to, like, take my metaphorical hat off to you that the way you jumped in with your family and uh, and by the way, your dad must be one tough cookie, right? I mean, to be shot at and run over and uh, like that's and get back up. And oh, you said, oh, yeah, he had a little neck injury. It's like <laughs> he is a strong dude. Well, you know, the whole process for him, he couldn't admit that he was being abused. And my dad was raised where you never raise a hand to a woman. Mm -hmm. So he didn't ever see what was taking place as abuse. She, he just saw that as, as an issue. He never saw that. And when I went to pick him up out of, out of the hospital after the last episode, and so the tough part is, is that this is, he didn't go into the hospital until day number four when he got so stiff in his neck that he couldn't move his head. And that's when I realized that the truck wheel had actually gone over his head and scooted it sideways and tore ligaments inside his neck. Wow. Wow. Oh, love this guy. Love this guy. Uh, you know, I, I dropped a motorcycle a few years ago and um, I wouldn't go to the hospital either <laughs> <laughs> until my breathing got so labored that my wife was like, "You look, you really need to go get that checked out. And turned out I had a punctured lung. So your your dad and I, we could hang out. Uh, <laughs> couple, couple of stubborn guys. Um, all right, but but let's stick with let's stick with this topic of high conflict and abuse. Uh, so I uh, your your father didn't. Uh, it sounds like your father didn't really believe that it was an abusive situation. He also didn't believe in being physical or reactive with a woman. So that kind of put him in a tough spot. You know, so I, I think it sounds like the first part is how. How do you recognize that you're that you're in a tough spot? I mean, without getting run over by a dually and shot at. <laughs> it's true. So it's really hard, you know. Um, men see things a little bit different, and women talk to women. And so another woman will tell a woman, "Hey, this is an abusive situation. This shouldn't be happening to you." And they want to help them and get them get them out of the house. They start helping with that. But one is men don't talk about it. They aren't going to share that their wife slapped them or that they were shot at or and and in my dad's case he might actually joke about it being yeah I ran away from a bullet kind of thing mm -hmm. but you have to kind of look at things I mean uh, these abusers take you away from your family they won't mm -hmm. let you go see your family they could put phone trackers on you. they want to know where you're at they they read all your texts they always want to know where you're at what you're doing who you're talking to those are all signs that that show you you're you're either in an abusive relationship or you're definitely heading towards that um and when the partner just gets abusive to the point that that you the only way out is to leave that leave the situation i mean this is the only story that i'm telling you about my dad but there are many other mm -hmm. stories i mean no, no no this is the this is like the peak of the mountain but there's a lot yeah. of, there are a lot of steps on the way up yep most definitely. And I hear people tell me, divorce coaches and mediators even, that, oh, I work in high conflict. And then when I bring them into a situation or even just talk to them, I realize that what they're referring to is situational conflict. And situational conflict is in every relationship. And some of that situational conflict gets really bad at the point because um, the partner you're divorcing or want to leave wants that control and they're, they know they're losing control. My own marriage got that way. He was losing control of me. I was always teaching my martial arts and things like that. And so he would do his best to restrict. I myself ended up with a broken hand, separated ribs and a dislocated leg and never went to the doctor. So I mm -hmm. get you guys. And it's that aspect that helps me to understand that men, men need some place to go. They need to be able to hunt for, a divorce coach, a lawyer, somebody that knows men and knows that men can be abused in the same way or worse than women. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
<laughs> the moral of the story there. He's just like, like that. Yeah, dislocated hip, broken hand. It's all, it's all good. We'll just keep on keeping on. But I'm curious, uh, help, help our listeners really understand the difference between situational violence or abuse or conflict and you know really super high conflict situ- general high conflict situ- situations uh like it's not situations it's really what's it what's the distinction between situational and sort of life long high, high conflict well or abuse it doesn't really matter on either term when things start to escalate you need out mm-hmm. you need out when there is any kind of escalation so my my hand and my leg and my ribs did not come from an abuse, abusive man. My situation was situational. And so whenever he would end up into a situation, and there was always alcohol involved on mm-hmm. his side, he would come home from work. And if he thought I was going to leave for any period of time, um, he would pin me down on the bed. That's how the, the ribs got it. And because I was trained, I released my hand from a grab and I hit a door jam and broke the door jam. And the last time when he actually physically pulled me out and we have to say that he had bent the door on my my van. So I punched and broke his nose and then he threw me. So it was situational. Now that last one, I could say he did it. Where the other ones, I would say he was trying to calm me because I was freaking out. I was out of control because I didn't like screaming and yelling all the time. So it sounds like situational might be where um, two people become triggered and it escalates. Yes. And yes. Whereas your father's situation, uh, he was married to someone who just was throwing stuff at him no matter what. Yes. His was abusive and became more and more abusive over time. Just like a situational, only the only way, you know, I think it's very highly possible my husband and I could have gone for counseling although we tried to after and he didn't like being put in his place um but I think that if we'd have tried early on it was very highly possible that we could have worked our situation out my My, dad was never going to get worked my personal opinion having worked with a lot of couples in a lot of different scenarios is that uh therapists and counselors are not as well prepared for let's just call it higher levels of conflict, whether they're situational or lifelong abuse. They, they understand it, but it's not what they typically see. And when it does show up, they try and handle it the same way that they handle all the other couples that come to their door. And it's just not the same. You know, when people uh, have permission in their own minds to be emotionally abusive or physically abusive, it's you're on a different planet than with people who are just you know people who are just a little explosive when they are highly triggered at odd moments. It's it's just it's a, a whole other country, and uh, as much as I honor couples counselors and family therapists, uh, I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of training for, that's involved with knowing how to decelerate these situations in a way that allows these people allows the people who are in them to still feel like they're in control and uh, of of their own lives right and I, I think that's kind of the challenge right T- like typically people who and maybe you, i don't know if you agree but it's my experience is that people who uh have given themselves permission to share their emotions in ways that cross boundaries for other people i'm being really general here you know, uh, th- that it, generally for them, it's about they want to feel like they're in control. They want to feel like they're managing their own lives. And sometimes when we go to couples counselors and ther- or therapists, they'll start telling us, you know what? You can't do that here. You know what? There's rules here. You can't behave that way. And the second that we start imposing rules on people who have permission, who have given themselves permission to behave outside of social norms, let's call it. You know, because like in Italy, people yell and scream at each other all the time, maybe not with as emotional abuse, but there's a whole different set of permissions about expressing emotion there. You know, when you when you express yourself outside of social norms and somebody says you can't do that here, the first thing you want to say is what? Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so it's <laughs> like it's it, I think there's a really it takes really specialized experience and training to work in that camp. Hey, and so you've had um, a bunch of training. What kind of things have helped you to deal with this? Well, um, like I said, I worked in law enforcement way back when. And so 
I actually trained, in, you know, physical combat mm-hmm. in, in that aspect. I was with the FBI aspect, um, mm-hmm. trained with them. And then because I'm, I actually got up to my fifth degree black belt and I continue to work out on that kind of stuff even now, but I have physical training that helps me in that situation. But mm-hmm. what helps me, I think the most is, is that I have a connection with our higher power, God, however anybody sees that I have that. And so I am not afraid to talk. I know that asking the right questions is going to get the mm-hmm. answers that I need. I know when I'm talking with somebody that they're not in a good place. So I ask the difficult questions. I'm not afraid of that. I've had multiple, I have um, several certifications in um, coaching and continue to get training all the time. Mm-hmm. I love the the order you put it in. Uh, you know, first, uh, you know what? I've had uh, tra- physical training so that I have confidence that whatever the situation is, I'm prepared to meet it. Not that I want to go in and ha- fight with my clients, but I know that you know that I can that if I can defend myself at the very least, like that's number one. I I can take care of me. I also have I have confidence in some a power greater than myself. So I'm walking in faith and confidence that I'm doing the right thing. That I'm going to know the next right step. And I've gotten all kinds of professional training that helps me to deal with these situations. Really sweet. Yeah. I, I think it's a great, great order of feeling feeling confident and knowing that you're a part of something bigger and that, that you're serving a greater good. However, that shows up for you. So important. And then having the training, that's my complaint about a, a lot of, not all, but some family therapists and couples counseling, is having the training to deal with those situations. Super, super important. Yes. I I mean, you can have book training and book training is great. It gives you tools that you can work with, but unless you know how to use the tool, it doesn't do you any good. Yeah. All right. So what kind of situations do you work with the most? Well, most of my situations are, are high conflict or in a lot of people's minds, extreme high conflict, Mm -hmm. um, making sure that my clients are one and first safe. And then um, in side notes, I've got people that come to me even after their divorces that they're having a hard time with their spouse. Their their ex is is saying, you know, I'm not going to let you have the kids more. I'm not going to do this. And they just fight with them. So Mm -hmm. we work through that to help them move forward, whether it's just emotional that they have to move forward or how to move forward in the court systems. Mm -hmm. And a thought that keeps coming up for me, then let me tell you why. I have a client who I'm working with who has had his trust repeated consistently, and he's validated that his trust has been repeated by breaking... uh, by breaking trust with his wife in like he's gone through her phone, like he's found her journal and stuff like that and, and continues to. And he says to me, um, you know what? I don't feel right about this, but he's having trouble not doing it because he never knows when she's telling the truth. Uh, and they're in the process, but they're in the, see, see, the thing is they're in the process of getting divorced. So now he feels like, all right, I got the information that I needed, but now I feel like I'm crossing a line. Uh, now that, that I could see how that can be framed as abusive. I'm curious, and also what I know about abuse from personal experience and working with people and education is that it starts with little things and that it, how we do one thing is how we do everything. It starts building up. So I'm curious if, if someone in our audience is listening to this and thinking, wow, some of the stuff that's going on here is not so good. How will they know whether it's... Uh, uh, restricted incidents, how will they know whether it's going to be building up to something more? Like, where, And how do they identify it before they get run over by a truck or shot at? Well, and again, um, in the case with getting run over or shot at, it's the escalation of voices. It's mm-hmm. the escalation of the length of fights. Um, everything that was this small becomes this big. You know, It's an escalation. And it's hard to tell but you have to step back out of it and you have to realize, wow, when we first got married, we'd have little arguments that lasted one or two minutes, just about a little thing. And then progressively they got to a point that they're lasting for, you know, an hour. And, and then there'll be points where they're lasting even longer than that. Once Mm -hmm. they get up to that hour, they've escalated. 
you're in an escalation, but the voices are also escalating. They're getting louder. Mm -hmm. And part of that's because they don't feel heard, but yes. you have to get through there. In your case with your um, client that you've talked about, so, so his ex has done some stuff and it's causing him to do some stuff. And that well, will make I wouldn't him say look like I wouldn't say it's causing him, but he's using it as an excuse to do what he's doing. Yes. It will it will create a situation in the court's eyes that he's the bad guy. And so mm -hmm. my job with him would be to say, Oh no, no, we're not gonna do any of that stuff. We're not gonna go through there. We're gonna so look like the good person. That isn't necessarily a case of abuse though. That's a kind of I'm kind of trying to kind of say what what's abuse, what is it, and how do we so once one thing you pointed out really clearly is you know that it's abuse because it's escalating. Yes. And, and so that is that case, but there are many kinds of abuse, the psychological and the gaslighting stuff where voices never get raised, but you realize, you know, is he telling me the truth? Um, mm -hmm. Is she, is she really doing what she said she is? Is she going to mm -hmm. be where she says? So you have to look at that because there's legal abuse, there's financial abuse, there's, and those kinds of abuse, like I have lots of clients that go through financial abuse. It will never get better. It'll never get better. So it sounds like also it can occur across modalities, we're going to call it. Multiple. So it's not, so if, if you're experiencing what something that feels like abuse in one area, rather than wait to see if it's escalating, what you might do is start looking at your finances or start looking at other areas to see what's going on. And I guess I think in my client's case, um, because he had no way to know what the truth was, he was being gaslit. Uh, there was denial on both sides. I can see, I completely understood why he did what he did. And at this point, he's expressing regret over continuing to do it. So, you know, that's a pretty good sign that at one point that might've been okay. And now he feels like he's crossing a line. So that might, the fact that he feels that way might indicate, all right, not so abusive. Yes. And, and the clients that I work with are divorcing people with mental disorders. Mm -hmm. That is a huge thing I'm, with my clients. My clients, um, soon to be exes or exes have a mental disorder of some kind, personality disorder, mm -hmm. um, narcissist, sociopath. Mm -hmm. So, and there, the one client that I had mentioned that lasted so long in there that his, his ex has multiple classifications. She has been diagnosed with multiple situations Got it. and, and they actually believed in his case, his siblings believed that he was possibly being poisoned. And you can see in the pictures, something was going on. Yeah. Got it. Wow. Uh, it sounds like you're doing some really important work. Actually, it doesn't just sound like. I know you're doing some really important work out there. And I, I'm actually uh, really honored to have you on the show and to have this time with you. I mean, no joke. There are not a lot of people who have the desire or courage to insert themselves in those kinds of situations, including myself. Like I, sometimes I feel like I'm being called there, but I'm like, I'm not so sure I want to go there, but you are like all in 110%, you know, you know, the turf, how could people find you? Well, um, I'm on social media. So Facebook under Tina Lynn Huggins, they can find me there. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok as coach Tina Lynn or uh, divorce Tina Lynn. Mm -hmm. And then my website is um, divorce, divorce coach specialist.com. Got it. And folks, if you didn't write all that down when she said it, don't worry about it. You can go to the podcast or video blog notes and find it or reach out to Rich in Relationship directly. We'll make sure that you can find Tina. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the question I ask everyone at the end of the show is, what is the legacy you want to leave behind? Um, I actually teach for the school that I got my certification. I teach their high conflict course now. And my I had built this blueprint that helps me with my clients. And so my hopes is to teach as many divorce coaches as possible my blueprint so that they can help as many clients as possible and hopefully save a life as we go through this. I love it. I totally love it. What a great vision. Well, look, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, let's do this again sometime. Great. Thank you, Rich.